Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here on this special day. Uh, thank you very much, Pastor Paju, for inviting me again and for your warm hospitality. And hearty congratulations to Nigeria on the 59th anniversary uh, as an independent nation. Nigeria has come a long way. Uh, you know, it's been a, a stable democracy for many, many years now. Uh, it is Africa's largest economy. Uh, it is the number six in the world in terms of internet users, uh, right behind China, India, US, Brazil, and Indonesia. All five of those economies uh, have larger populations than Indonesia. The uh, Indonesia also, uh, also not Indonesia, Nigeria, uh, the, and I have, of course, been coming to Nigeria now for many years. Uh, plus, I've had students from Nigeria uh, in my own business school. Uh, and so, you know, the one thing that I have uh, con concluded about, you know, through these interactions, that the fundamental DNA of a Nigerian is that of an entrepreneur. Yeah, and so, 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 so that's, uh, uh, that's a phenomenal aspect of what we can say human capital or national capital. Uh, the also, you know, uh, other uh, interesting and important observations that I have about Nigeria is uh, in the most recent World Bank ease of doing business rankings. Uh, the actual rankings will be coming out uh, later in October, the, but they have already uh, announced who are the top 20 improvers. And the top 20 improvers includes China, it includes India, but also very much it includes Nigeria. Uh, so congratulations again. And uh, some of the areas that the World Bank has pointed out in terms of where Nigeria has shown the most improvement over the last one year, for example, new electronic platform for taxes and corporate affairs, for starting a business, for registering property, for getting construction permits, uh, and so forth. And also, you know, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to uh, note that Nigeria continues to march ahead. Uh, you know, some of the observations uh, that uh, uh, I made is, for example, the official approval for the Bakasi Deep Sea Port, uh, the, the very recent, uh, the central bank push to speed up the transition to a more cashless Nigeria which is hugely important in many, many ways, including financial inclusion, uh, you know, because when people, uh, uh, and, and, you know, of course, uh, financial inclusion has many things, but the one thing about cashless uh, society uh, is that you need to have some kind of an account and all the transactions get recorded, so you're very much, then you become part uh, of the, uh, let's say, the economic or the financial system of the country. Uh, obviously, uh, Nigeria is Africa's largest economy. So what happens in Nigeria, what uh, Nigeria does, number one, it is important in many ways, but one of the ways in which it's important is that it moves the needle for Africa. It is very difficult to move the needle for Africa without actually Nigeria uh, moving its needle. So that's number one. Number two uh, is that as the largest economy in Africa, Nigeria obviously is a role model, uh, just like China has been a role model in India. And just to, to give you an example of what I mean by Nigeria as a role model, uh, again, looking at Asia, so Anand Mahindra is one of India's uh, big uh, industrialists, a billionaire, one of the world's richest people, highly respected, highly respected. So he's not just rich, but he is phenomenally respected for the professional way uh, in which he runs uh, his company, Mahindra Group. But what he made an observation a few years back that for about India, that for a country that invented yoga, India did not really start to stretch until China forced it to. Uh, so therefore, China acts as a role model, if you will, for uh, other countries in Asia, certainly for India, similarly Nigeria serves as a role model for other countries uh, in Africa. Uh, so, and obviously, uh, talking of Africa, and this is an observation uh, that some of you may remember if you were here uh, at the May 1 uh, event, the platform event, 
uh, is that Africa is the world's oldest and the youngest continent. Obviously oldest because that's where humanity originated. Uh, and youngest uh, because in terms of demographics, in terms of population, uh, it is the youngest continent in the world. So with that, uh, sort of looking uh, at uh, where Nigeria has been coming from and what the achievements that it has made, let me now look at the present and look ahead. So when I look at the present, obviously uh, much work lies ahead. Uh, and I'll focus really on the economic dimension. Because when we look at the economic dimension and say, what are the most important measures of the economic success of a society? Uh, before I pick GDP, I would look at per capita income. And I would look at, is per capita income moving ahead or not? Actually, I should uh, uh, put per capita income as number two. Number one, I would look at employment levels. And, and so employment levels and per capita income are the two most important measures of the economic health of a society. And both are important because one without the other uh, actually is somewhat illusory. Uh, to uh, uh, detail a little more, that imagine a society where employment levels are actually high or unemployment is low, but per capita income is not going anywhere. That essentially means that one is distributing poverty, uh, and which is not necessarily the best situation. On the other hand, one could imagine a situation where per capita incomes are rising, but unemployment levels are also very high. What that means is actually that inequality in the society is rising. And that again is neither morally, ethically acceptable, nor is it sustainable. So therefore, really, and if we look at both of those measures, there is a lot that Nigeria needs to do. Uh, for example, uh, the figures, uh, according to several estimates, that in the 15 to 35 age group, uh, the level of unemployment or underemployment in Nigeria is well higher than 25%. So that uh, clearly tells us something needs to be done. Uh, and the sec you know, and, and again, of course, unemployment levels are important, not just that, uh, you know, for people, uh, but at the society level, high unemployment level is, uh, runs the risk of feeding xenophobia. So if you look at, you know, the recent developments uh, that took place in South Africa, for instance, against, uh, foreign, uh, against foreigners, uh, especially foreigners from other African countries, including from Nigeria, is that, you know, one way to look at it, in my view, is to look at the high unemployment levels in South Africa among younger people. Uh, so high unemployment levels, therefore, are not acceptable either individually or socially at the level of society. Then if you look at per capita incomes, uh, that uh, since 2015, so we are looking at about now five years, four, year, four to five years, that since 2015, Nigeria's GDP growth rate, real GDP growth rate has been slower than the growth rate of the population. So what that means is that per capita incomes in real terms in Nigeria have uh, declined over the last four to five years. Uh, and obviously, if you look at the currency effects, uh, then uh, in terms of Nigeria's weight in the global economy, that has uh, declined over the last five years. So that tells us that a lot uh, needs to be done. A lot of the work lies ahead. And that sort of has a foundation for some of uh, what uh, uh, I want to share with you, my thoughts. Now, of course, you know, what are the underlying issues uh, from my perspective as an outsider to Nigeria? The, uh, and the, the, the biggest underlying issue, uh, I think, is uh, that Nigeria is, the economy is overly dependent on oil and gas. And I'm sure to everybody in the room, I'm not saying something uh, that is somehow very profound or uh, that you don't know uh, deeply. Uh, and of course, you know, that's uh, being overly dependent on resources is a fundamental challenge for a society. And it's a challenge for society in both good times and not so good times. Good times meaning when commodity demand is rising, when uh, commodity prices are rising. Those are good times. So obviously, the country's GDP grows. However, that because commodities or resources, including oil and gas, don't generate a lot of employment, 
that the rise in, the, uh, in, in, in GDP driven by commodities, for example, oil and gas, it doesn't necessarily fuel growth in employment. So what it does is, yes, it brings the country resources, but also it exacerbates inequality. Uh, so, so, uh, so therefore, and ultimately what's needed uh, for a society to have sustainable economic growth uh, is to create, uh, you know, a boost the middle class. Uh, and so, and that really requires boosting manufacturing, industry. Uh, and that's where, if you look at Nigeria, you know, it's manufacturing to GDP uh, ratio. Uh, the, it's about 7.8 or 8 percent. And that is extremely low. Uh, so, you know, so if I look at over, de over dependence on oil and gas and uh, massively under dependent on manufacturing, uh, that's really kind of the big issues. And just to put that 8 percent in perspective, so if you look at countries like China, countries like in uh, Vietnam, like Indonesia, uh, their uh, manufacturing to GDP growth rate is somewhere between 25 to 30 percent. Okay, so if you're talking about an emerging market that's boosting ahead, uh, that's the kind of manufacturing contribution to GDP one needs to have. India, the country where my roots lie, even though I live, I've been living now in the U.S. for more than half my life, that India's uh, manufacturing to uh, GDP is about 17 percent. Uh, so that is, yeah, that's well higher than Nigeria's, but well below that of some of the other countries in Asia. And in, in India, the 17 percent is fundamentally viewed as far too low. So therefore, you know, clearly 8 percent is something for Nigeria is far too low. So those are the big uh, kind of issues diversification of the economy, if you will. So now, uh, the, if we look ahead, uh, and we say, okay, Nigeria today is 59, and then in 16 years, Nigeria will be 75. So if we were to say Nigeria in 75, and how do we create that Nigeria? That will be, you know, even far more vibrant compared to the Nigeria of today. Uh, and if we are talking about uh, a, a country that can grow uh, at about 5% growth rate in real terms, real terms meaning net of inflation and everything, that in 15 years, 16 years, Nigeria's economy would be more than two times that of what it is now. And that's in real terms. In nominal terms, of course, it will be even you know, far bigger. Uh, and so how, does, how, how, how do we create? How does uh, you know, one create? And there, ultimately, every society is a partnership. It's a partnership between the government, uh, between large companies, uh, between the, 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 the medium, small uh, enterprises, uh, between uh, the young professionals, uh, and of course, society at large, NGOs. Uh, the, for example, uh, the organization here. So I look at what are, you know, what are the things that, from my perspective, various actors, if you will, uh, might actually need to do. Obviously, for the government, many, many things, uh, but I pick, let's say, the single most uh, important aspect, uh, at least based on my analysis. And the single most important aspect, I would say, is electricity. Okay. Uh, and perhaps, you know, of course, roads and highways, other uh, you know, segments of infrastructure are very important, but electricity, I would put even ahead of roads and highways because electricity, you know, if you look at the, the industrial revolution that made America and uh, uh, Europe rich starting from the early 19th century, it's really, it was, you know, that the lungs which provide the power to the body and it was steam engines first and then electricity next. And so without that power, the lungs of the economy, it's very difficult, impossible to march ahead. Uh, and if you look at in terms of the electricity that is produced in Nigeria, it is very inadequate. And obviously, that's uh, a, a, a segment of infrastructure where the government almost always has played a major role. Uh, in fact, you know, the, the, there's a World Bank uh, estimate that if Nigeria had continuous access to power, its economic growth rate each year could be 2% higher. Think about it, 2% is massive. 
Uh, some estimates I was reading in Financial Times that the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria says that 40% of the cost of production goes to power. And if 40% of the cost of production is going to power, naturally, uh, that is going to act as a constraint uh, in terms of the development, the rise of manufacturing. You know, if you look at Lagos, for instance, and look at the traffic and the number of vehicles on the road, it's obviously both crazy and impressive. But then you say, you know, how many of these are manufactured in Nigeria uh, versus imported? Uh, so that begins to raise some question marks. And one of the major factors will be, obviously, it's not that people don't know how to make cars or assemble cars. It's because the cost of power is way too high. The, another, of course, on the, you know, pick some of the, high, uh, the, the big things that uh, not just at the level of, say, the federal government, uh, which plays a major role in, say, infrastructure, but at the level of state governments, uh, clearly urban planning is a huge part. You know, I was reading some figures that Lagos, for instance, and it is kind of, you know, in some sense, shocking in terms of the scale of work that needs to be done, that Lagos is estimated to add 10 million more people by 2035. And obviously, if 10 more million more people, if these estimates are valid, uh, that requires massive urban planning uh, in order to uh, avoid, prevent other problems. Moving on to now corporates, uh, that what can companies do, especially the larger companies? Obviously, uh, the Nigeria has, uh, uh, in the financial sector, many large banks. So, so that, uh, you know, in, in some sense we could say is quite healthy, plus of course all the fintech revolution uh, that is going on. But, you know, and we have, uh, you know, the uh, uh, illustrious uh, Mr. Dan Gote and Dan Gote Cement. But if you look at in the manufacturing sector, that if Mr. Dan Gote can create uh, uh, a powerhouse, a global powerhouse in that sector, uh, what about other global powerhouses in other manufacturing industrial sectors, whether it is in uh, automotive or in food uh, processing uh, and so on? So that's where people need to look at Mr. Dan Gode as a role model, if you will, and say, how can we replicate uh, that story in other sectors of the economy? The, uh, also, uh, large companies uh, need to take leadership in terms of going green. Uh, because you know they have the muscle and they are they make investments in manufacturing they have large office buildings and so on to think about how you know uh, we can reduce our footprint carbon footprint uh, uh, on earth now uh, you know whether it is in uh, terms of the uh, the factories and how we manage what kind of uh, processes we have what kind of Affluence, how do we manage uh, the you know, use of solar, use of wind, uh, and so on. And perhaps even more important than that uh, would be you know, how to leverage the uh, newly created African free trade area. Uh, and I think that's phenomenal for the continent. And why is it phenomenal for the continent? Because if you look at growth rate of economies around the world, these days, two of the fastest growing economies in the world are India and China. And you know, there are several reasons why uh, they are growing at a rapid rate. But one of the big factors is just the scale effect. Because what happens is that when you have a large economy, you just take two aspects of, of the large economy, uh, and I take the case of India, is that when you have a large economy, then for foreign for multinationals, it makes sense to manufacture locally rather than to export to that economy. Because the large size of the economy creates the opportunity, already obviously labor costs are low, other costs are possibly low, but the large scale creates the incentives, economic incentives to say it just is logical to manufacture within India or manufacture within China rather than export to India or China. Also, you know, the, uh, both of these uh, emerging markets, India and China, have extreme, a few extremely strong uh, universities, colleges, that are globally powerhouses. Uh, the Indian Institutes of Technology in India, or Tsinghua in Beida in China, Fudan, and so on. What happens is that when you have a large economy, then 
uh, even though the overall quality of the education may still be weak. But because of the scale effect, it is possible to create five, ten world-class institutions. Uh, and so that scale matters. And so that's why, you know, even though Nigeria is a large economy, large country, largest in Africa, Africa's scale is obviously much larger than that of Nigeria. And so what does it, 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 it mean for companies? And I think for companies, what it means is that Okay, so the government signs up uh, and becomes part of the African free trade area. But then who is going to be the actor? Who is going to leverage this new opportunity, this new African integration? It is not going to be the government. It is going to be companies. So how do, what can companies do to think of themselves as not just Nigerian companies, but as African companies or continent-wide companies? How do you create, you know, uh, these continent-wide champions, you know, it could be organic uh, means, which means you know you enter and you build up your presence in other markets, or it could be through joint ventures, or it can be through acquisitions. But clearly, companies need to take a role because Nigeria's economy is ultimately a sum of the uh, value added by all the economic actors, including companies. And if Nigerian companies become African continent-wide companies, they uh, help leverage that scale effect for Nigeria. Another you know, thing that uh, uh, the large companies need to do uh, is to embrace digitization at full speed. Uh, and you know, because uh, you know, this is the era, if we say, you know, what's the single biggest development in the world today? Uh, even more than perhaps than the rise of emerging markets, it would be the rise of technology, particularly the rise of digitization, which is affecting everything, what product people want to buy or service, uh, or digitization of existing you know, cars, for example, are becoming computers on wheels. Uh, so therefore, digitization of everything, and who takes the lead in that? It has to be large companies. Uh, and of course, when large companies take the lead in digitization, because uh, large companies become the central node in a hub where they have many of the smaller companies that are suppliers uh, uh, to the large company. So there is a digitization of the large company will have a spillover effect on the digitization of the ecosystem as a whole. Another thing that large companies can do is, you know, I'm thinking about the analogy of IKEA. Uh, IKEA being the Scandinavian uh, global furniture powerhouse right, the largest in the world. And IKEA, for, from the time that it was founded, of course, you know, uh, it doesn't manufacture anything itself. What it, IKEA does, it buys, sources, all the products from contract manufacturers. But the IKEA's philosophy from the very beginning has been that its goal is not just to buy from the contract manufacturers, but actually to build and upgrade on an ongoing basis the capabilities of the contract manufacturers. That the contract manufacturers are not just suppliers, but they are partners, and they are partners in a capability system. So therefore, large companies, uh, it is important for them to say not just that I buy from A, B, and C, but how can I upgrade the capabilities of A, B, and C? And that's their contribution, if you will, to the upgrading of the small enterprise uh, uh, segment of society. Large companies, naturally, uh, uh, they should play a role in launching accelerators uh, where startups can be created, uh, or at least, let's say, some of the impediments that get in the way of startups uh, can be reduced by providing free or very low cost space, uh, uh, power, internet connections, uh, and so forth. Uh, the one thing that I, if, if, if I look at, and again, what's happening in India, uh, it has uh, many billion, you know, multi-billion dollar companies, uh, global giants, uh, many billionaires, and so on. And one of the things that very, very uh, uh, pleasing to me as somebody uh, who comes from India uh, but it's something totally generalizable is the, in CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, some of the big uh, players, what they have done is taken the lead. But overall, the level of education system in India is still very weak. And if, uh, you know, I was to hold my breath and wait for the government to create uh, schools and make sure that teachers actually show up, 
You know, I mean, you would die before, you know, that would ever happen. Uh, but what's happening, obviously, the government still needs to do its part. So we cannot say, uh, you know, we let the government off uh, and focus uh, only on young ventures. But then what's happening is that because of digitization, a number of ventures have been created that are roaringly successful, uh, that are now solved, beginning to solve major social problems uh, without waiting for the government. So for instance, there is a company, the biggest company in this space in India is Baiju. And Baiju is now actually one of the unicorns, you know, companies that are valued more than a billion dollars with global VCs, including from Silicon Valley and SoftBank from Japan and so on. And Baiju, you know, I mean, it's pure online classes, courses uh, that you subscribe to. There's some, uh, to some extent, you can get it free. Others you subscribe to. And, you know, like classes all the way from, uh, you know, elementary level classes one to three, or children at the level of one to three, all the way to high school and beyond. And so for children ages one to three, what they have done is done a deal with Disney, that using Disney stories, Disney characters, uh, create actually online video courses for young children. Uh, and then, you know, in various areas, whether it's about reading or about simple addition or uh, simple arithmetic and so on. Uh, and then, of course, there are quizzes and tests and so on, etc. All of that acts, uh, you know, it can either act as a supplement to what happens in the school or in the case where, in fact, uh, there happens to be no school. That now, if you look at connectivity in terms of mobile and mobile broadband, that connectivity everywhere, including in Nigeria, is very rapidly becoming almost universal. And you look at the, the, the cost of devices, whether it's a smartphone or in fact a uh, low level, uh, low price tablet, you know, the price is dropping, dropping, dropping to such an extent that everybody, no matter how poor a family is, they can afford it. So now if you have a, 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 a very uh, low price device and you have uh, mobile broadband connectivity, all you need is content. Uh, and, and, and some of that content already exists. But content, you know, like in India, it's being created in local languages. It's being created, some of that, by companies such as Baiju. But a lot of other local content is being created by master teachers in local dialects, in local languages. Uh, and there are foundations, uh, corporate foundations, or personal foundations, or global foundations like Gates and so on. They support, uh, they finance. Uh, this kind of a so therefore that's where actually uh, really the role uh, for uh, and again you know Baiju is going all the way from class one to three uh, and beyond. Uh, there's a, a, a company in China uh, that is doing something similar, but instead of uh, having actually master teachers develop courses, uh, this is an AI based uh, so that you have a device, low end device, uh, you have uh, uh, of course mobile broadband connectivity. And then, you know, you go to the website and then say you want to learn math. Uh, so, you know, and you have, it's, it's actually an AI system that's feeding you problems uh, based on your, where that individual child is. Uh, so that's an opportunity. But then, you know, look at other areas of education. So there is a company in India called Team Lease. And Team Lease is the largest player, again, a startup, but not too small anymore, uh, is to train skilled workers, you know, so it's like carpenters and electricians and plumbers to take people who are unskilled and make them skilled workers. Where actually, you know, clearly does industry need people like that? Yes. Uh, and the payment for, for that is made by the employers. So therefore, uh, for the individual uh, who is being trained in these skills, there is a it's not a zero cost because you need to have some skin in the game. Otherwise, you don't kind of take it seriously. But ultimately, the cost is low for the individual and the rest is paid by the employer. So, you know, another uh, example of what we can say that there is a market failure. Companies need skilled workers. People are willing to become skilled workers, but the two are not connected. And a venture gets created to solve that particular problem. Take another uh, area where uh, uh, young professionals can create ventures to solve major social problems. Take healthcare. Now, in healthcare, uh, the, uh, there are many aspects of healthcare that needs to be fixed in 
every society. But one of the, the, the aspects that needs to be fixed in most emerging markets, emerging economies, is the, the having you know, trained doctors and trained nurses. Now, obviously, if you are talking about trained, as in you know, degrees in medicine, and degrees in nursing, and so on, that takes time. And it takes time to scale that up. But then, you know, if you look at, for instance, China or India, you know, take China, even under Mao, they created these barefoot doctors. <clears throat> and so barefoot doctors clearly are not the same as somebody with an MD degree. But, you know, if, <clears throat> but there's kind of, we don't have to think of healthcare professionals as in binary terms. Either you have a, a, a professional degree or you are nothing. But how about something in between? And just take nurses, for instance, so there are, uh, ventures being created where uh, <clears throat> purely through online mechanisms one can get certified as a nurse practitioner. It's not the same thing as a degree, but it's certainly halfway there. And now, you know, and, and who can create this kind of a, uh, just like teaching children or converting unskilled into skilled workers? How about converting people uh, who are interested into becoming now actually, quote unquote, you know, nurse practitioners. And, and, and then they can be connected uh, through apps or through Uber-like peer-to-peer uh, uh, connections to individuals who need medical, who need healthcare advice. Uh, the, and so, you know, another area uh, in education where young professionals can create companies uh, is uh, ventures is how about, you know, teaching people software. Because, you know, if the whole economy is uh, going to become digital, which, you know, there is really no doubt that it is happening, uh, the, the demand for software uh, professionals, uh, you know, as far as I understand from talking to people, whether it's in Silicon Valley or at, in the computer science department at my university, is that the demand for, un, you know, kind of foreseeable future for software professionals whether it's in the US or in India or in China, and I suspect the same for Nigeria, will continue to exceed the supply of uh, software professionals. So therefore, you know, and we, who, who uh, you know, how does that training take place? I mean, India's whole IT revolution was not driven by, uh, uh, you know, the IITs, the Indian Institutes of Technology that train software engineers. The whole uh, IT revolution in India was driven by young ventures that came into being that would offer one year or two year programs uh, and that would uh, therefore offer certificates, not degrees, in this type of programming or that type of programming. Uh, okay. And so therefore, and that's again, who plays that kind of role? It's not the universities, but it's actually young ventures, ventures created, educational ventures created by professionals. Then, you know, other areas, um, you know, social problems where young ventures can play a huge role is take healthcare. So again, I talked about uh, how one can train nurse practitioners uh, using uh, technology in the education domain. There's a company uh, in India, it's a, you know, not very successful, uh, it's no longer, I mean, it's a startup, uh, but still now it's a startup that has proved itself to be very successful and is growing rapidly called Practo. And what, does, what Practo does is that it really, you can think of it almost like an Uber model in, for healthcare. So they have various professionals that are part of their network, which includes nurses, which includes physical therapy specialists, which include doctors, which include dentists, and so on, etc. And then, of course, you have customers. Uh, and you can sign up uh, for various kind of levels of programs or services. And there are different levels of pricing, etc., where you can get uh, you know advice from a professional uh, on through online chat. You can get advice from a professional through a voice consultation, or you can use Practo to set up uh, an actual in-person appointment. Uh, Practo also has an online pharmacy, so the professional then says, "Okay, you need X Y Z medicine." Well, you know they have an online pharmacy, so it gets delivered to your home. And what we are really doing is eliminating friction, all right? Eliminating scarcity. Uh, and that is, you know, so eliminating scarcity and friction, whether it's in education or in healthcare, those are really the major economic and social challenges where actually digital technologies are now being used by uh, uh, people to create 
by young professionals to create companies. Uh, you know, there are uh, roaringly successful self-help apps in India. So, you know, of course, uh, you know, the overall level of, uh, you know, adult literacy in India is still quite low. I mean, well, quite low, meaning it's about 75%, but that's, you know, again, if you look at uh, the distribution across males versus females, literacy among females, among women, is still actually pitifully low. And so, you know, and how do they get, uh, you know, help? Uh, say, somebody is pregnant, okay? So therefore, how do I, you know, what do I eat? How do I manage myself, okay? So in local languages, there are not apps that the person can go to. Of course, you've got to market those apps and so on, where the person can figure out, get advice. Now you have a baby who has been born. How do I take care of the child? So again, there are apps. Uh, and those apps can provide uh, uh, advice from a server, or the, it can become a network, and where there are more experienced mothers from the same community who can now provide advice in the local language uh, to another person within the same network. Of course, there is remote diagnostics. Uh, through the mobile phone, it's now becoming smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. Where, in fact, very recently, somewhere in the last couple of months, I don't yet know the details of it, but Google announced that they have, uh, you know, created uh, uh, through the smartphone cameras by looking into the eyes uh, and then sending it to a server to be able to detect diabetes, okay? And so obviously uh, that kind of a technology and that kind of an app would be extremely expensive, almost free. Uh, and so can ventures be created uh, to take these technologies being developed uh, and bridge, here is technology, here is the user in Nigeria, how can we bridge the two? Uh, so then again, of course, uh, take another area, you know, we, I have been talking about Uber, uh, obviously that's an uh, area of personal transportation, uh, and so you have, uh, and you know, there's a company in uh, Nigeria created uh, uh, O-Ride, which is for uh, personal transportation in the, using motorbikes rather than cars, uh, but, you know, the, the, the sharing economy, the same Uber model, if you will, or Airbnb model, is now getting implemented in trucking. Uh, so you have trucks which have extra capacity or idle capacity, and then you have somebody who needs uh, uh, trucking service. You have, you know, warehouses. Somebody has excess space in a warehouse and somebody else needs space in the warehouse. So you can create another venture. Uh, ambulances. Uh, the, you know, do we rely on the state or actually can we create uh, an Uber-like uh, 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 venture uh, that can bring ambul ambulance service on demand? Blood donation, you know, there are so many people who need blood and so many people uh, who are willing to actually donate blood. How do we connect the two, you know? The, uh, how about the delivery of medicine to remote areas? Uh, how do we bridge that? Can we use drones? Uh, uh, for, uh, to, to solve that problem. Uh, there are ventures being created uh, in many, many countries, including the US uh, and China and India, about farm machinery. So you have farm machinery that sits idle uh, many times, and then you have people who don't have farm machinery. Can we bridge the two? Uh, uh, and, and essentially, you know, there's a, uh, so one of my uh, friends in India, uh, or actually the son of a friend in India, he's created a very successful, very successful venture, uh, and which is very interesting. I haven't seen that anywhere. And the venture is actually the students in the last year of college. So as they are, you know, one year away from embarking into the real world, they need coaching, they need advice, and they need advice not in terms of the subjects, because they are learning those in the college, but they need advice about how to think about their career, okay? Career management. So that's on one side. And on the other side, they have actually people who might be 25 years old, 30 years old, 35 years old, uh, who are working in companies, they are professionals, but they have time, some time on their hands, maybe in the evenings, uh, or weekends, and they are willing to devote that time to be a mentor, a coach, to this student who is in the last year of college, whether in engineering or business or other fields. And again, this is not for charity in this particular company's case. Uh, the students pay a fee, 
the perhaps the college agrees to pay a fee as a way to boost employment uh, for its graduates and future success of its graduates and the 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 the, the, the more mid senior level professionals who devote their time they get paid for their time so it's 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 a venture you know which is again bridging that you know demand and supply that historically is not being bridged agriculture you know and so of course uh, as you know very well, there are issues about Nigeria uh, and its dependence on foreign uh, food supplies uh, and, you know, what issues, what problems it creates and what should be the government policy in that regard. But naturally, you know, it would be whether one agrees or disagrees with, with various aspects of the government's policy, uh, it would be hard to disagree with the point that agricultural productivity, it would be good for the country. Uh, it would be good for China, it would be good for India, it would be good for Nigeria to boost agricultural productivity. And in boosting agricultural productivity, for instance, there is a venture in India, now it's about eight years old, uh, still a young venture, but young as in, you know, still, you know, already multi-million dollar successful venture called CropIn. And CropIn has, uh, you know, global investors, including from Silicon Valley, Gates Foundation has its own uh, uh, venture fund which invests not for charity purposes but actually to make money uh, so so that fund from the Gates Foundation has, is also an investor put in a few million dollars into this venture and what cropping does it says okay so now you know you are the farmer you could be a small farmer or a big farmer you have a mobile phone you register on our network and it's not for free but the but but the prices are you know I mean, essentially, the price that the farmer pays versus the value that the farmer derives, the, the value is so much larger than the price uh, to the farmer that the farmer has no problems signing on. So you sign on as a member. And what you do, you know, on a regular basis, you take pictures of your crop, of the leaves of the crop, and you upload it uh, to the system. And the system now, crop in system, they have real-time data uh, on in terms of weather. They have uh, uh, machine learning uh, at the back end. Uh, they have, uh, of course, satellite imagery to look at what's happening, not at that particular farm necessarily only, but also in that particular region. And they combine all of that to feed back to the farmer about what to do, about you know, what kind of disease you probably have, you know, what should you do about it, for instance. Also, so they give you know, ongoing uh, micro level uh, as best as possible, seven-day weather forecasts, which is you know regularly updated. They give to the farmer advice on what to plant season by season, or can you plant two different crops on the same land at the same time? Uh, how do you monitor crop health? How do you estimate what the harvest is likely to be? Uh, you know, advice regarding pest management. Uh, and so on, and all of that information, of course, that's given back to the farmer, but then for a whole collection of farmers, that information in the form of a dashboard goes to the local government officials or agriculture management officials so they can figure out from a more kind of a wider policy planning purposes what they need to do. Uh, and, you know, and again, I mean, if this kind of an approach, at least what the, the figures are, that the productivity of each farm, even the smallest farms, goes up somewhere between 25 to 50 percent. That's huge. That's huge. So, so, so that's again, you know, in the area of agriculture. And finally, if you look at infrastructure, you know, take electricity, going back to electricity that uh, I started out, is that uh, you know, now the cost of solar uh, has become so low uh, that uh, on a total cost basis, total cost basis, the uh, cost of solar is now lower than the cost of traditional uh, thermal power. Uh, and it's, you know, thermal power is not becoming cheaper by the day, but solar power is becoming, you know, continues to become cheaper by the day. So therefore, can young ventures be created already in many economies, uh, such ventures exist, uh, to, you know, rooftop mini solar for homes or mini grids for villages. And so you also have, in addition to the, uh, the, the solar panels, you have a battery storage. And that battery storage is connected uh, through the internet, uh, mobile internet, to the company that is providing this kind of a service. And essentially, uh, through the app on the smartphone, the, 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 the person in the house, if they need power, okay, they could sign on to a deal that they have continuous power. 
or they could sign on to a deal, almost just like ordering a taxi or ordering an Uber. Okay, I need power now. And the, the battery, which is disconnected uh, from use, gets turned on, gets connected, and you are charged, let's say, for the one hour of power that you need, and so on. So these are examples of how, even in the area of electricity, like infrastructure, where young ventures are beginning to play a role. Uh, so, you know, with that, I will uh, uh, close my own talks and, uh, uh, you know, sharing of my own ideas, and perhaps we have some time to, uh, uh, for a Q&A, uh, Pastor, would that, uh, yes? Okay, so the, uh, and, you know, just to summarize, I think Nigeria has come a long way, but uh, with, you know, this concerted action, uh, collaborative action by the government, by large companies, by medium small enterprises, by young professionals, uh, by, uh, you know, civil society at large, I think Nigeria at 19, at, uh, you know, uh, at 75 years of age from now uh, could be, should be, uh, at least two times in real terms, net of inflation, or what it is now, but actually, you know, potentially, why two times, why not three times? And think about what, how different a Nigeria will be if it's per capita income, which is about $2,000 today, per capita income, net of inflation in real terms, was not 2,000, but 4,000 for the whole country, for 200 million people or more, or if it was 5,000. So that's, that's the kind of uh, you know, potential where everybody in society needs to collaborate and contribute. So with that, uh, thank you very much.